Hi, fabulous fourth graders. Welcome back. Yesterday, we began learning two ways to organize and represent data. What were those two ways? Yes, if you said bar graphs and line graphs, you're absolutely correct. Remember, we had taken some data that had already been collected, organized it in charts and tables, and then represented it using line graphs or bar graphs, okay? So today we will continue with line graphs and bar graphs. It's just that we will focus a little more on the interpreting part of line graphs and bar graphs, okay? Are you up for the challenge? Well, let's go. Let's get started. We will begin today by reviewing. Remember when we left off yesterday, I told you that we, will re we would review your homework or your independent practice. So we will start today by reviewing that independent practice of creating your own graph for the two sets of data that were given. Okay, so let's check it out. We ended yesterday's lesson with independent practice, and your task was to create graphs that best represented the given data. And here you see independent practice A, the first example, car sales last week. The data has been carefully organized into a table and then represented using a bar graph. Yes, a bar graph was the best graph to represent the given data. Okay, so let's take a look at our graph. You were to use the website to create a graph. No worries if you were unable to access the graphs or access the website or even navigate through the site. It's okay. You could have used paper and pencil to create your graph. Okay. It has a title. It has both the vertical and the horizontal axis. You have your intervals and spacing. One last thing to remember as well, because it can be a little difficult transferring information, just making sure that your data that's inside of your table matches the data on your graphs, okay, or in your graphs. Something else to consider are the intervals. In this case, the intervals were kind of created for us, but as you're making your own graphs, you can create your own intervals. What do you notice about the intervals here? Yes, they're counting by, it's counting by eights. And so you could have made your graph count by twos, fours, fives, tens, but just keep in mind, you wanna make it nice and simple. So look at our, look at the data. What's the highest number of cars that were sold? 40, yeah. And so we wanna make sure we definitely include 40 on our graph and we start at zero, but it probably wouldn't have made sense to start our graph at one because that would have taken a long time to graph that. So you just want to be smart and wise in choosing your intervals, okay? So again, I suggest twos, fives, tens, whole numbers that makes it easier for you to graph, okay? So that's example A. Let's take a look at example B. So what do you think about example B before moving forward? Which graph did you decide to use to graph your hippo population? Hmm, yeah. So if you decided to create a line graph, you're absolutely correct. So for independent practice B, the hippo population, you should have created a line graph because this information or the data collected here shows change over time. It shows the population um, from 2005 to 2010, okay? And here's our graph. Here's what your graph could have looked like if you had used the website. If you have drawn, if you had drawn it yourself, it should have still looked the same. The only thing may have been different um, is the end are the intervals, okay? So once again, the intervals are counting by eight, okay? And make sure that your data in the tables or charts matches what's on your graph. Okay, so I have a final thought for you, a bonus thought. Okay, think about a question hmm, that could have been asked or that can be answered by reading this graph. Then what I want you to do is write that question. 
So write a question that can be answered by reading your graph. Right now, it's just data and it's a graph. You have organization and you have representation. And so now we want to move to that interpretation part, interpreting graphs. And so if you had to write a question, what would that question be about your graph? Okay. So here's an example. Mine could be, hmm, how much did the population of hippos grow from 2006 to 2008? Okay. Another question could be, hmm, if the graph were to continue, what do you think the population of hippos would be in 2012? So those are just two examples. So go ahead and write a question that can be answered by reading your graph, pause if you need to, and then press play to continue. Our I can statement for today is, I can interpret data by making observations and inferences about characteristics of data in bar graphs and line graphs. As always, let's unpack a bit. Interpret. So this should be easy because many of these words we've heard already. Interpret. What does that mean? It means to draw conclusions. What about characteristics? Oh yeah, we use this term when we were discussing plain and solid figures. Yeah, it means they're traits. Um, observations and inferences, you probably use those words during a science lesson. And of course, your bar graphs and your line graphs. So we're going to make some, draw some conclusions. We're going to use observations and inferences to draw those conclusions. And we're going to talk about traits in order to draw some conclusions in bar graphs and line graphs. So a lot of words, but an easy task. Okay. So here's what I mean. Observations and inferences. Observations, what do you see? What do you notice? Inferences, what conclusions can be made by what is seen or noticed? So for instance, take a look at our graph here. What kind of graph is this? A line graph, water level. So this line graph has something to do with water level in feet throughout a week or a five day period. So some data was collected and after the data was organized, collected, organized, it was then represented in a line graph. So what do you see? Let's make some observations. What can you conclude? Okay, what inferences can be made? So let's check it out. Before I give you your answers or give some possible solutions, turn and talk. What do you think? What do you see or notice? What conclusions can be made by what is seen or noticed? Turn and talk. When you're ready, press play to reveal some possible solutions. All righty, here's one. One observation, the title of the graph is water level. Simple, right? We see it here. Another, the water level was the highest on Friday. How do we know that? Because we can look right at the line graph and see here's Friday. Here's the water level at 30 feet. Hmm, it's higher than all of the other days. At first, the water level decreased and then it increased. But we first have to know what decrease and increase mean. Decrease. Oh, at first it decreased, it went down, and then it increased. It went up. Okay, so that's an observation because I can look right at the line graph and see that. The greatest increase, uh oh, the greatest increase in water level occurred from Wednesday to Thursday. So from Wednesday to Thursday was the greatest increase. How do you know that? Well, first we have to find the decrease. If we look here from Tuesday to Wednesday, it didn't increase, it decreased. But 
from Wednesday to Thursday and increased. It did increase from Thursday to Friday, but the greatest increase was from Wednesday to Thursday. And hmm, if the graph continues for another five days, the water levels may continue to increase until the next Monday. Ooh, that's an inference. That's a conclusion that can be made based off what we see. We see that, hmm, it started, it decreased, and then it steadily began to increase. So I can infer that if the graph continues for another five days, the levels may continue to increase until next Monday because I'm using what I see already to make this inference. So that's what I mean when I'm saying you have to use um, observations and inferences to help interpret and to be able to answer some of these questions um, using graphs. Let's try another example, but this one is a little different, okay? It's kind of like we're going to use observations and inferences. It's two la layers. Use observations and inferences to determine what's true and what's not true. So this is, yeah, another step. Hmm, so we're gonna look at a, what kind of graph is this? Yeah, a bar graph. So we're gonna use this bar graph, peach jam cost. But first, before you begin to read anything, before you begin to answer any question, you first have to observe the graph. Take a look at it. What do you see? What do you notice? How is the graph created? What are your intervals? Hmm. What are we graphing? So those are all questions you should ask yourself before you begin to answer any question. Okay. So we see this graph is about peach jam. Um, my vertical axis tells me how much the peach jam costs. My horizontal axis tells me the name of the stores. So I can see the Drake store. So Hmm, or Drake store, how, I can see how much the peach jam costs at Drake store. But hmm, here's the catch. We have to know what these intervals mean. So I see that my graph or this graph is in intervals of $1. But these lines in between mean something. What do you think they mean? What is the value of each line? Hmm. How did I get from zero to one dollar? One dollar to two dollars, two dollars to three dollars. How did what's in between? It's like a number line. Each tick mark means something. What does it mean? Hmm, there are one, two, three. Oh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Hmm, and I know in a number line between each whole number, hmm, could this mean that's 25? 50, oh, 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents, $1, $1.25, $1.50, $1.75. Yeah, so, so on and so forth. That's what that means. So it's very important that before you begin to answer any question, you take a look at what's given. Look at the information that's given. That will help you to move forward with answering questions. Okay. So, what observations or inferences, or use the observations and inferences to determine which statements are true? Okay. Statement number one, peach jam is more expensive at Hoskins than Jenner's. Is that true or false? So, this is an observation. Remember I told you this one is a little different from the first one. The first example, Hmm, we just had to come up with, make some observations and inferences. This time, we have to use what we know about observations and inferences to determine if it's true or not. So let's check it out. Peach jam is more expensive at Hoskins than Jenner. Here's Hoskins at $4. Here's Jenner's. Hmm, what is that? Hmm, that's $3, $3.25, cents, $3.50. So is that true? Yeah. So peach jam is more expensive at Hoskins. And even if we didn't count, we can see that this bar, Hoskins bar, is taller than Jenner's bar. Next, the cost of peach jam at Parks is $4.20. Hmm, 
Hmm. Parks. Let's see. Hmm. Parks. Four dollars. Well, that's four dollars. We already said that was twenty-five fifty. Up. Oh, so is that true? No. So this time, this observation is not true. So someone made an observation, which is what you see, but they just didn't see it correctly. They made an incorrect observation. So this statement is not true. And how about this one? Peach Jam at Drake's is $1.25 cheaper than it is at Jenner's. What does cheaper mean? Oh, less than. Okay. So Peach Jam at Drake's. Let's see. Drake's, $2.25. And then Jenner's is hmm, $3.25. So that means $3.50 mine is two dollars and 25 cents is that correct is absolutely correct so with that being said we have two correct statements and one incorrect statement it's now time to show what you know you're going to need your paper and pencil for this number your paper from one to six you can fold it it doesn't matter you can just write the numbers on the paper as long as you have a section labeled one through six, okay? So before we begin, let's review really quickly. Observations, go, turn and talk, tell someone. What does observation mean? Yeah, what's seen or what do you notice? Inference, inference means, what do you think? I can't hear you, yes. Inference means drawing conclusions based on what you see or what you notice. And so all of that is used to help us interpret graphs and help us understand what's going on in the graphs so that we're able to answer these questions. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to answer a few questions about organizing data, about representing data, those uh, uh, making observations and inferences to in order to interpret the data. So are you ready? Let's get started. So here's what will happen. Uh, a question will flash. And if you need to press pause, press pause to allow yourself some time to think. And when you're ready, press play so um, to reveal the answers so we can discuss the answers. Here goes. Question one. How many kids have either a dog or a cat? What do you think? Remember what we talked about? What should you do first? 11, how do you know that? Dogs, four, there are four dogs. Cat, there are seven kids with cats. So you put the four dogs with the seven cats for a total of 11. Number two, cherry drop prices. About how much does a bag of cherry drops cost at Lark's store? What do you think? Remember, at any time you can press pause and when you're ready, press play. And the answer is B, $2.90. How do you know that? Well, let's take a look at Lark's store. Hmm, remember, we have to first make sure we look at everything in the graph. And we know that this graph, hmm, is counting by 50. It's in increments of 50. 50 cents, $1, $1.50, $2. And also remember, just like your number line or on a ruler, every space has a name. So each space in between means something. It represents something. And so for Lark's, hmm, here's where Lark's stop. It's not quite at $3. So, hmm, which choice can we get rid of automatically? D, because it's not even at $3. So how on earth can we choose $3.10? So we can slash that. Hmm, what else do we notice? Well, if this is $2.50 and this is $3, well, somewhere in the middle of $2.50 and $3, 
comes two dollars and seventy five cents because we have hmm how did I get from zero to fifty cents or fifty cents to one dollar much like our example in the beginning that means each line in between is an increment of twenty five so that's twenty five fifty seventy five one dollar one dollar twenty five one dollar fifty and so on okay so hmm. This is $2.50, so this line here will represent, or represents $2.75. So what's another choice we can slash or get rid of? Oh, A, $2.60, because Larks is well over the $2.75 mark. So it can't be $2.60. So hmm, we've already said that it's over $2.75, so it can't be $2.70. So the only logical choice is B, $2.90. How did you do on that one? Okay, let's keep going. Number three, using the graph, which statements are true? Hmm, what do you think? This one may take a little longer, and that's okay. Press pause, and when you're ready, for discussion, press play. Hmm, a local movie store counted the numbers of movies that were rented from the store for a week. The data is shown in the line graph. Movie rentals, here are a number of movies, day of the week, and our line graph. So, A, the least amount of movies were rented on Sunday. That's the observation because we can just look and see that. It dips here. That's only 75 movies versus 275 movies on a Friday. Okay, so the lowest or the least amount of movies were rented on Sunday. That is true. C is another correct answer. There were more movies rented from Friday through Sunday than from Monday through Thursday. A lot of words. So let's break it apart. Take one section at, at a time. There were more movies rented from Friday through Sunday. So what you would do or what you should have done was taken Friday through Sunday and did the math. What did you come up with? Okay, how many movies or so from Friday to Sunday and compared it to how many movies from Monday through Thursday. And that, then you would have found the answer is truth because from Friday to Sunday, it's more, more movies, even though it's only three days the weekend, more movies were rented from Friday to Sunday than Monday through Thursday. Now, don't let it trick you. That's more days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's four days versus three days. It doesn't matter. We're looking at the numbers. We're looking at the number of movies that were sold. So if you do the math, Friday to Sunday may have been about 575 movies versus just the 500 movies that were sold from Monday to Thursday. So that's why C is another correct answer. D. The same number of movies were rented on Monday and on Thursday. Another observation, because we can just look and see. The same number on Monday. Monday is, about, is 125, and Thursday is 125. Correct. So let's take a look at B to see why B isn't true. The greatest amount of movies were rented on Saturday. Hmm. Well, here's Saturday. Here's Saturday, 225, but wait, do we have something greater? Yes, Friday, 275. So well, that's why that's not true. Okay. So for this last one, or I shouldn't say last one, there are three more, but you're gonna use the same graph to answer the last three questions. Here goes. In which month is the average temperature the greatest? And which month is the average temperature the greatest? Answer them first, and then we'll discuss the answers after all three have been completed. Number five, about how much is the difference in average temperature between the month 
with the highest and the lowest temperature. Ooh, I'll read that one again. About how much is the difference in average temperature between the month with the highest and the lowest temperature? And six, which of the following statements is not true about this graph? A, the average temperature is warmer in June than in September. B, the average temperature is cooler in March than in October. C, the average temperature increases each month from February to May. D, the average temperature decreases each month from June to November. Take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, press play. So number four, which month is the average temperature the greatest? That is July, and we can make that observation. So this one, you have to know the months, okay? So which month is July? What number month is July? Oh, seven. So it is the greatest. About how much is the difference? It's about 45 degree difference an average temperature between the month with the highest, so we have to look at that highest, July, and the lowest, which is here in January, okay? About, and then we do the math. What does difference mean? What does difference mean? Yeah, it means to subtract. So we had to do some subtraction to come up with about 45 degrees. And six. Which of the following statements is not true about this graph? The average temperature decreases for each month from June to November. So here's June, number six, to November. Well, wait a minute, November is here, so it can't be true because from here, the next month it increases and then it starts to drop. So this can't be true because it's saying it's starting at um, June and then goes down, but nope. The next month, it month it, it it increases and then it goes down. It decreases. Okay, so how did you do on all of that? Wow, a lot of work. So once again, that's how you use observations and inferences to help interpret information in order to answer help answer some of these questions. So. I think that's it. That brings us to the end of today's lesson. Real quick, real short and simple. Today's goal was I can interpret data by making observations and inferences about characteristics of the data in bar graphs and line graphs. So yes, we use observations and inferences to help us draw some conclusions and we use characteristics of the data in both bar graphs and line graphs, once again, in order to help us answer questions. So I'm sure that you completed the quiz with 100% accuracy, and if not, try it again. It's okay. Go all the way back to question number one. Take Now that you know the answers, take a look at each question, each graph, and see where did you make your mistake. Okay, give it a try. Until the next time, take care. I'll see you later.